What a large part of our lives we spend with the magic of stories. Reading them or listening to them or looking at them on the screen or on TV or telling them to each other or even dreaming them. Night dreams, daydreams. Why are stories so important to us? Well, I can think of at least two reasons. First, some funny quirk in our minds makes us want to invent or enjoy happenings that go beyond our daily lives and yet somehow seem to relate to us. What happened to Cinderella or Superman will never happen to us. But in each of us is hidden a Cinderella or a Superman crying to get out. The second reason we seem to need stories is that real life is not perfect. It's mixed up, confusing. Real life, a writer once said, seems to have no plot. These shots are very pretty, and they may seem striking and dramatic, but they have no point, no meaning. But the storyteller takes a chunk of real life, or fantasy life for that matter, and changes it around, turns it into something with a shape and a meaning. It is here on this street that our story takes place. Here, where we find two mere children, greatly in love, and whose tales shall soon be unfolded. And this is Christmas, a special time of year, a time for special surprises. That's the beginning of a short story. And now I want you to listen to the shortest story ever told. In the room, sat the last human being on earth. There was a knock at the door. I've always liked that one. It still scares me. It's got a form, a shape, even though your imagination may want to supply a possible ending. It surprises you, perhaps even makes you laugh nervously. But it's too short. There's not enough to it. A short story should be long enough to grab your attention for some time and short enough to be read at one sitting. And that's rather different from a novel, isn't it? Edgar Allan Poe, who really started the American short story, believed it should have a compact, unified effect. And every detail should be chosen with this effect in mind. Today, many short stories don't obey this rule exactly, but even they must have a plot. The English novelist E.M. Forster once defined a plot this way. The king died, and then the queen died, is a story. The king died, and then the queen died of grief is a plot. What's the difference? The difference, says Foster, is that if it's only a story, all we ask is, and then? But if the story also has a plot, we ask, why? We've put in the idea of cause or motivation, and that brings in character and conflict. We could talk about a lot of other things that make up a good short story. We'll mention one more, kind of hard to explain. It's style. A Frenchman named Buffon once said, style is the man himself. It's something the author puts into every one of his sentences, as well as into the shape and content of his story. It's like a voice or tone. Form, content, meaning, plot, Characters, conflict, style. When all these are in balance and concentrated into a brief narrative, we've got a short story. 
To see how short stories work, we've made screen adaptations of three examples by famous writers. Here's how we first see Della and Jim. It's the gift of the Magi, the O. Henry story. Jim, what about dinner? Oh, I don't know. You decide. Nothing too fancy. Oh, looks good there, Della. Yeah, it does. Not as nice as I wish it could be. Remember last year when you brought me those roses? And that sleigh ride in the park? Yeah, and your parents waiting up for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was dandy when we could afford it. What does the scene do for us? We've met two young people, married, in love, not rich, living in a city, and it's Christmas time. Setting and time are established. So are two more things. Jim's watch. What would you do without that thing? I don't know. Beauty, though, ain't it? Della's oh. hair. Stop that. You know I'm just going to have to put it up again. Well, and you know how much I like it, Dell. I know. I know. Somehow we already feel they're going to figure in the story. And another thing we feel is the tone. It's realistic, about ordinary young people. That's what I like. And all this we've learned in the first minute or so. Oh, the short story you. concentrates. If you've read this story, you know it ends with a surprise twist, as so many of O'Henry's stories do. That was his specialty, and that's what we look for when we read him. The Necklace by Guy de Maupassant also has a surprise ending. But the point of the story, what Poe called the unified effect, depends not only on that surprise ending, but upon what life does to the two main characters before we come upon the ending. O. Henry wants to jolt us, and he does. But Maupassant wants to move us, and he does. Like O. Henry, he starts with a young couple. They, too, are not rich. They're invited to a very fancy party. And to make a grand appearance, the woman borrows from her best friend a superb diamond necklace. How about this? That? Yes. Well, if you really sat on it. Oh, I am. <laughs> From our modernized screen adaptation of the necklace written almost a hundred years ago, we show some scenes, beginning with their entrance. Hello, Senator, how are you? Thanks a lot for having us. Come and speak my wife, Betty Lou. They're in love, they're young, they're happy, life is good. But when they get home, Mattie realizes she's lost the precious borrowed necklace. George. And there we have what most stories do have, a main complication. George, uh, just a minute. No, George, now. What? It's gone. What, what are you talking about? The necklace. What do you mean? It's gone. It's gone. Now what? Well, to replace the necklace, they have to beg, borrow, work themselves to exhaustion in order to repay their terrifying debt. Now, some years later, let's look at them. I didn't think it would take this long. What did you think? Five years. Five years this has been going on. We haven't even paid half of it back yet. If we can just... Look, I don't want to discuss it anymore, all right? I don't even want to talk about it. I won't tell you how it ends, but even from these brief scenes, you can feel what Maupassant is after. An impression of the sadness of some human destinies. Just a glimpse, a flash, but reading the story or watching the film, that flash still sticks in your mind. Like the gift of the Magi, the necklace is realistic. It could happen. But some stories tell about things that couldn't happen. For example, The Magic Shop by the English writer H.G. Wells. I said before that a good story has a theme, a point, a central meaning. 
In the magic shop, though it's never exactly stated, the point is the power of the imagination. Some of us have a lot of imagination, some not so much. A father and his little son enter a shop that sells magic tricks and toys. Dad, if I were rich, I'd buy myself that and that. <laughs> it's less than a hundred days before your birthday, Kip. May I help you find anything? This little scene does something important for this particular story. It establishes an atmosphere, a, a weird, eerie feeling. Without that feeling, the story's final effect would be lost. Here's the next scene. Tut, tut, careless bird. <laughs> and as I live and breathe, nesting. What these scenes do is give us some sense, which the rest of the story develops, of the different characters of the shopkeeper, the father, and the little boy. The interaction between the atmosphere and the characters makes the story. We've now mentioned or illustrated just a few of the factors that make up a short story. Characters. Nice. Twenty dollars. Plot. Twenty. Take it or leave it. Atmosphere. Style. Tone, whether realistic or fantastic. Motivation. Point or meaning or effect. When we read a good short story, we're not usually conscious of all these factors. All we know is that the story has interested us, entertained us, scared us, moved us. It's added a tiny bit to our feeling for human life, for our own human lives. As long as the human imagination survives, so will the teller of tales.